Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Taylor, I'm Chief Executive of the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here for this evening's special event. Um, before we begin, can you turn your mobiles to what I heard someone describe yesterday as bookshop mode? Um, so you can keep it on, but it mustn't make a noise. Uh, we're filming tonight's event and live streaming over the web, so welcome to everyone joining us online. And a reminder for you in the room and online that the hashtag is RSA Inequality if you want to get involved in what I'm sure is going to be a lively conversation on Twitter. It's a particular pleasure to welcome tonight's distinguished guest uh, speakers. We're inviting them back to the RSA because they came here to speak about their previous work. Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett's 2009 work, The Spirit Level, has been one of the most influential non-fiction books of the last decade. Uh, in fact, I think we made a podcast last year about how influential it had been. It showed how less equal societies fare worse than more equal ones, drawing on evidence from across a whole range of social measures from health and education to levels of violence and life expectancy. And it catalyzed the significant attention now given to the impacts of inequality, not just in policy circles, but in the wider public debate. We were proud to host Kate and Richard here back then. I think we even had another event in which you debated with people who disagree with you. So lively was the, the, the discussion that you, you created. So we're delighted uh, that you've joined us again this evening to share insights from your new follow-up work, the inner level, which reveals the impact that inequality has on us as individuals, how it affects us psychologically, how it makes social relations more stressful, undermines self-confidence, distorts natural differences in personal abilities. Arguing that society is based on fundamental equalities, sharing and reciprocity produce much higher levels of well-being than those based on excessive individualism and competitiveness, the inner level sheds important new light on how we should organize the way we live together and promises to yet again place inequality at the very centre of public debate. Uh, Kate and Richard will do a, a double act, and then I'll ask them a, few, a, a couple of questions myself before we open it up to the room. So please join me in welcoming Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson. Thank you very much, Matthew. You described that debate as lively. I just remember it as extremely painful. Um, being exposed to the judgments of other people is exactly what our new book is about. Um, and we write from both personal experience as well as epidemiological analysis. Thank you all for coming tonight. And um, we're going to spend, I think, about 20, 25 minutes talking about some of the content of the book. We can't cover all of it, but we'll give a couple of pointers to what we're leaving out, and perhaps we can pick up those issues during the question and discussion time. So the inner level is really building on our previous book, The Spirit Level. And that book, The Spirit Level, had three core messages. One, the first, was that income inequality is linked to a very broad range of health and social problems. Health problems like lower life expectancy in more unequal societies, higher rates of infant mortality and obesity, more mental illness, which we'll talk much more about this evening, but also a range of social problems like lower levels of trust, higher levels of violence and imprisonment, and effects on children's life chances. So we saw lower social mobility linked to higher levels of income inequality, more young women having babies as teenagers, and lower educational attainment in more unequal places. And the second core message of that book was that these effects are surprisingly large. There are not just nuanced or subtle differences between different societies. They're big. So we see two, three, four times as much mental illness in more unequal countries compared to more equal ones eight to ten times as many teenage births, rates of imprisonment that are 12 to 16 times higher. So big differences, huge differences between the rich developed countries and between the 50 American states linked to income inequality. And I think the third fact was perhaps the one that surprised people the most, and that was that it isn't just the poor who are affected by inequality, it's all of us. And we have colleagues at Harvard University who describe inequality as a social pollutant. It's like air pollution. We're all exposed to the level of inequality in a society. We can't escape from it. 
And while the poor are affected the most, even the wealthy, the affluent, the well-educated, and those of high social class suffer, the mo suffer as well. <coughs> but basically, the spirit level was a statistical presentation of data. It was filled with chart after chart linking income inequality to one problem after another in the rich developed countries in the 50 US states. Um, if you can understand this chart, you really could understand the core messages of, of the book. It was, that, it was that straightforward. And we presented this pattern, this consistent pattern, and discussed what we thought were some of the mechanisms that might be linking inequality to the health and social problems that we were looking about. But it's in our new work that we seek to go deeper. We seek to dig beneath that pattern and truly understand why inequality is linked to health and social problems. And also to think about what kinds of ideas might um, prevent us making change and give some notions about where we might go if we want to improve things. So the inner level, again, I think has three core messages. And the first is that we show how income inequality strengthens the grip of class and status on all of us. And that's what we're going to spend the next sort of 20 minutes discussing with you. We also talk about how popular myths about human nature and capabilities are used to justify inequality. I'll mention those again briefly at the end, but perhaps we can pick up that point in our discussions. And we also write about how we can tackle inequality and particularly why it's vital to do so if we're going to make that transition that we need so desperately to sustainable well-being. So I'm going to hand over to Richard now for a little bit. Yes, so... <clears throat> the problems we've looked at in the spirit level are all problems, I mean, the common factor between them is they're all problems with social gradients. They're very different problems, but they're all more common at the bottom of the social ladder. So although there's violence and drug abuse at the top, it's much more common at the bottom. Um, uh, ill health and all the others. It's specifically problems with that pattern which inequality makes worse across the whole society. Many of those problems are behavioral, things like violence, teenage births, um, a whole host of uh, other outcomes, which told us that somehow uh, inequality was having effects through the brain, I mean, psychosocial effects. Um, and the spirit level, I mean, the, the inner level, was really uh, a decision to unpack that a bit further. And with the research that's come online, um, people around the world, we now have a much clearer understanding of that deeper level uh, of effects of inequality, how it gets into the mind, if you like, um, affects our thinking. And as Kate said, it increases the importance of, of status and class. Um, <clears throat> I often think um, a, a good example uh, of what I mean is um, uh, this um, <clears throat> program, um, The Apprentice with uh, Alan Sugar you can see the desperate striving for status amongst those people and their regard for high status. Um, and we'll show you the, the way this leads into narcissism and so on. Um, <clears throat> but at the core of this is that uh, in a society where the status differences are much bigger, some people are hugely important, other people are looked down on as if they were almost worthless, we all worry about more about how we are seen and judged. We judge each other more by status. That vertical dimension of society becomes more important. Um, and the psychological effects are to do with that, um, the growing importance of status, which gives rise to those worries, those insecurities about self-worth. Um, and those insecurities actually get right to the center of social life because your worries about self-presentation, how others judge you, whether they think you're clever or stupid or successful or failure, um, that make social meetings for many people um, extremely stressful. 
you know, social contact can become an ordeal, so you try and avoid it. Um, and even people who don't feel those sort of social anxieties as strongly, we all know those sort of worries. Um, and it does seem to be those worries about how you're seen and judged, which are uh, not the worst stresses in society, obviously losing your um, home or something like that are worse, but they are the most widespread uh, sources of stress. And so they are the drivers of many of these big societal outcomes we look at. Um, <clears throat> uh, why has that come out? There it is. Um, <clears throat> One of the ways of summing up what inequality does to the quality of social relations, um, and I think it does it through these anxieties about how we're seen and judged, um, is shown in uh, evidence like this, the many papers now showing that involvement in local groups, uh, social cohesion, um, particip participation in voluntary activities and so on declines. You also see a decline in trust big changes in people's feelings about whether they can trust most other people. There are also research papers that show that um, in more unequal societies, people are less willing to help each other, less willing to help the old and less willing to help disabled people, things like that. Um, but as well as that, very well researched all over the world are is the rise in violence, usually measured by homicide rates, uh, which also uh, goes with inequality. So what you see is a move from societies with strong community life, a good deal of reciprocity, helpfulness and so on, uh, to an atrophying of all that uh, and that rise in violence. And then if you look at much more unequal societies than we've uh, looked at in our work, uh, societies as unequal as Mexico or South Africa, um, you find that these processes have gone another major step forwards. You find that houses again and again are barricaded, bars on windows and doors, fences around people's yards or gardens with razor wire on top. Not just a few homes, but house after house after house. So people in those very unequal societies are becoming afraid of each other. That's absolute disaster because the work on uh, happiness, on, on health, shows how vitally important the quality of social relations is between us, both at a personal level with friends and more widely in terms of community, community life in society. And so inequality strikes at the heart of issues to do with well-being. Um, and these things aren't, you know, I, I don't say that friendship is beneficial to health as a sort of nice idea. Experiments looking at wound healing or susceptibility to infection, very careful work, shows that it, it's really, whether or not you have friends, is at least as important as whether or not you smoke to your survival in a follow-up period. You know, these things are really powerful. And it is cutting us, inequality cuts at the heart of that. And that's why you see this transformation of social relationships. But it isn't just a story I've put together around those few bits of evidence. Uh, if the, there are a couple of papers where people look at the proportion of the labor force in each country or each American state involved in what's called guard labor. People in security operations, security staff, police, prison officers, the people we use to protect ourselves from each other. That also goes up with inequality. So you see those signs of breakdown of community, increasing fear of other people, um, as well as you see it both ways in the uh, uh, security, um, the expenditure on security. So that's the picture in Mexico. But you also see it in the data. This is uh, data on status anxiety in more and less equal societies. Along the bottom, uh, you've got the deciles of the income distribution. On the left, the poorest tenth of the population. On the right, the richest tenth of the population. 
And you see, in more unequal societies, that top line, there is more status anxiety right across the scale. It's not just something that affects the poor. Um, and in this way, you can... I, I, and I want you to relate this to your own insecurities about self-worth. Of course, these, we'll always have those feelings to some extent, but they're exacerbated by the scale of inequality. I'm now going to hand back to Kate. So those levels of status anxiety, which are so much higher in more unequal societies for rich and poor, create different kinds of responses. And what we're writing about in the inner level are the different ways in which people respond to those status anxieties that are caused by those higher levels of inequality. And really, there are three different sort of groups of responses. One is to do with those feelings that the anxieties caused by status are so heavy that people want to withdraw from social life. Their self-esteem declines, their self-worth is lowered, they feel they are not worthy, they withdraw from social interactions, they become more depressed, and they become more anxious. So that's one way in which some of us respond to greater inequality and more status anxiety. In a sense, we go under when those pressures are much higher. But there's another type of response as well, and that's to say, well, I'm okay. There's nothing wrong. Society might be stressful. Other people have anxieties about status, but I'm doing all right. I'm great. I'm right. I'm very smart. Does this remind you of anybody? <laughs> and this alternative way of responding, of putting on a good face, um, self-enhancement, as psychologists call it, bigging yourself up, as we talk about it more commonly, that response becomes more common in more unequal societies as well. So we see a rise in that kind of um, narcissistic self-presentation. And with obvious implications for societal well-being, because if people in power have these kinds of feelings and emotions and behaviors, it's potentially quite damaging to the rest of us. But then there's another way, uh, perhaps a more obvious way in which people respond to anxieties about status, and that is to try and show through the things that they buy or consume that their status is high. And so we see more rampant consumerism and overconsumption <coughs> linked to income inequality. And there are now some great studies coming through that actually look at Google search data in more equal and unequal societies and show that people are looking for high status goods more in more unequal places. Consumerism, of course, and consumption doesn't tend to buy happiness and is obviously a barrier to achieving environmental sustainability, so we do need to find ways to curb it. And in many of our societies, I think there is a real sense that this consumerism is somewhat out of control. You can buy a Louis Vuitton rubbish bag to put your rubbish outside your house. If none of you have these, I would encourage you to buy them. It's a good way of presenting yourself as a high status person. And if you can't afford to shop for designer goods, you can go on eBay and buy some designer carrier bags used by other people that you can use to put your cheaper high street shopping in to look as if you shop <coughs> in designer um, stores. But although these, these stories are, are somewhat amusing, of course, when we have rampant consumerism and overconsumption, then people have to work ever, ever harder to try and keep up. So we've known for a long time that working hours are longer in more unequal societies. And you won't be surprised to see that as inequality rises, so does household debt. So people extend themselves um, with credit to enable them to keep up with the Joneses in ways that not only don't improve their own happiness, but provide an additional stress to themselves and their family lives, 
Debt is a profound cause of mental ill health, worry and stress and strain for children as well as adults in families. And of course, all of those other kinds of um, behaviours where we indulge in certain things to try and compensate ourselves for our low feelings of self-worth or our worries about how we're seen, all of those sorts of behaviours increase as well in more unequal societies. So we'd shown in the spirit level that um, problematic alcohol use increases and so does use of illegal drugs. There are now data on problem gambling that weren't available to us back then showing a link between income inequality and levels of gambling. But overeating as well, eating for comfort, so all of those different ways in which we try to make ourselves feel better, those increase as well. So mostly I've been showing um, some pictures, but we can't resist a good chart. So we are going to show you a bit more data as well. Yes. Um, I, I think our book is, is really relevant to the sense of social malaise in our societies and the evidence of rising uh, mental ill health. You know, the, the um, Mental Health Foundation uh, just a week or two ago said that 74% of the adult population uh, suffered stress uh, that was, they found overwhelming and made it impossible for them to cope. 32% uh, said they had suicidal thoughts. 16% had actually self-harmed at some point in their lives. And this is in a society where we're, you know, high standards of living, all happy consumerist societies, we all love shopping and all that kind of stuff. You, you know, there's another truth to what's going on. And I think that, and it's, you understand inequality, I think, if you understand what the drivers of, the, say, the school shootings in the States and consumerism have in common. They're both in an important sense about showing uh, your worth. You know, the, the school shooters, people who've been pushed down, ignored, and they're getting their own back. They're showing they can't, they can't be ignored. Um, and consumerism, again, those feelings of very low self-worth, the people most involved, most addicted to shopping, if you like, uh, the psychological evidence from those people shows that it's, you know, acute worries about status, uh, the social anxieties, the worries about how you're seen and judged, the worries about self-worth. Um, <clears throat> we were enormously helped by a paper by Sherry Johnson and uh, her colleagues, um, which went through a huge range of mental illnesses and personality disorders, vast number of papers, uh, showing that uh, a good number of them were related to issues to do with dominance and subordination either accepting your inferiority or endlessly fighting against it or assuming your superiority or your life becoming about climbing up and avoiding um, being put down by other people. Um, and I think sh she thought that all societies had a similar social hierarchy. We believe that actually what income inequality does is determine whether we have a very steep social p class pyramid like that or a much shallower one. And we got in touch with her and said, look, there's already evidence that some of the uh, mental conditions you're talking about are actually more common in more unequal societies where those issues of dominance and subordination are exacerbated. Um, and so uh, not only had we shown that mental illnesses as a whole um, were worse, more common in more unequal societies, but now since then uh, work has come out saying depression is more common um, in more unequal American states and now in different countries. Um, <clears throat> there is evidence of narcissism. This is a measure called self-enhancement. So people are asked in different countries, do you think you're cleverer than the average person in Britain? Uh, do you think you're more uh, attractive? Do you think you're more generous? It's a bit like, you know, the joke that 90% of the population th think they're better drivers than average. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same sort of thing going on. It's a form of, of uh, talking yourself up, um, exaggerating your abilities, and actually measures of narcissism in the US, you can see them rising with inequality. But also schizophrenia, which is another of the conditions that uh, 
uh, came in that paper of um, Sherry Johnson's. Um, so we have quite good in, uh, uh, evidence of the different responses Kate was talking about, being overcome with depression, low self-esteem and so on, or the narcissistic talking yourself up, flaunting your achievements rather than being modest. Um, all part of this same process, uh, responding to feeling much more judged by status. Um, now, Kate, to finish off. Mm. And no more graphs, I <laughs> promise. I can't remember where this cartoon came from. Was it from The Economist? Economist. I think it was from The Economist. Um, shows a, a, a rich person, perhaps with a vested interest in, in not promoting a more equal society, putting a match to a copy of the spirit level that, that, that somebody is reading. Um, and as Matthew alluded to earlier, our previous book did encounter what I would characterize as ideological resistance by those who believe that we need a certain level of inequality for various reasons. They say that we need it to promote creativity and aspiration. That's not true. We actually see lower number of patents per capita in more unequal societies. Well, they'll say that you need some inequality if you're going to have economic growth, and we now have Nobel Prize winning economists saying that's not true, and economists at the World Bank saying that inequality gets in the way of poverty reduction and creates economic instability cycles of boom and bust. But there's a couple of other myths that people believe about unequal societies, I think, that allow them to continue to tolerate high levels of inequality. And the first is the notion that we are in our innate human nature. We are competitive, individualistic, aggressive, and so we can't solve inequality because it's just a result of human nature. Well, that's not true, and we spend time in the book talking about the evidence we have that that isn't true, and we actually, there are two sides to human nature that are shaped by the kind of society we live in, which strategy we choose. And we can talk about that more in discussion if anybody would like to. And the other myth is that we live in some kind of meritocracy where the clever and the capable move up and the less capable um, or the lazy move down. And so the inequality we experience is, is fair because it reflects people's hard work and talents and capabilities. So we spend a substantial amount of time in the book disproving that myth and showing that actually it is inequality that creates those social distinctions in attainment, achievement, and capabilities. It is the environment that shapes how people do and whether or not they can realize their potential. So that rather than inequality being caused by a social gradient in talent and capabilities, it's actually the other way around and it's inequality that is creating those conditions. And finally, we spend time in the book thinking about how we move forward and create a more equal society. We spend time talking about how inequality is a roadblock to the transition towards sustainable economies, particularly in relation to I need to restrain that rampant overconsumption and consumerism, but also the ways in which inequality reduction offers a positive alternative vision of the future to one that is just about belt tightening and having to do without. We show we can actually have more with less. And finally, we talk about what kinds of policies are needed to achieve greater equality. And in particular, we discuss how we would like to see an extension of greater economic democracy as a way of establishing greater equality more firmly within the culture, creating more of a culture of egalitarianism so that income differences are reduced before taxes and benefits, and greater equality becomes less vulnerable to the decisions of governments around taxes and spending on welfare, etc. So I think... No, I'm going to leave that to the question time, because I think we've probably spent as much time as we should. That's the book in a nutshell, and we look forward to discussing it with you a little bit more over the next half hour.
Great. Uh, thank you both. Um, is that for me as well? Richard. No, just for Richard. Apparently. Yeah, Your mic's not working. Um, uh, let me start with the kind of hardest, que hardest question in a way, um, which is that there are outliers. And one of the arguments that you w was put to you that you didn't address at the end was that people would say, well, you know, Italians seem to be very unequal but quite cheerful. You know, is this, is this the pasta effect or, you know, or, or that teenage pregnancy rates halved in this country while inequality didn't shift at all. I'm just interested because people will hear this because there will be that predictable backlash. What is your best way for us to understand the fact that there are these quite big outliers, actually? Or should we understand them as kind of denting the overall theory, or that it's just that we don't quite understand why? Well, I'll, I'll talk about the outliers, and then do you want to talk about why things perhaps sometimes travel at, at different speeds? Um, outliers are always... They, they're kind of interesting, because you think, well, why, yeah, why is Italy sort of off the line? Why does it not have as much mental illness as you'd predict, given its level of income inequality? And of course, none of the problems we're looking at are only caused by inequality. They're all affected by a whole range of, of other things. And so you can get sort of drawn down the path of thinking about, well, why, why are things better in Italy? And what most people, I think, believe about that particular outlier is that family life is very strong in Italian society, and maybe that's predictive. Um, those data are rather old as well, and it may well be that political instability and some of the other problems in Italy are, are changing those things. So outliers have always got a story behind them, but what interests us is the common variance that we see again and again and again, a significant relationship between inequality and problems that can't be explained by chance. And yes, other things are affecting this pattern, but that, that common pattern is the most interesting thing to us. And it's such a strong relationship that it's not, it's not being significantly affected by those outliers. And it's the common pattern that needs the explanation rather than the, the oddities. But epidemiologists, we're always good at explaining the oddities if somebody sort of pushes it. We can always speculate. So, so on this kind of time lag issue, Richard, which is that what people uh, in this country often used to refer to as the social recession, you know, rising teenage pregnancy, rising crime, alcohol, drug use. That social recession seemed to have kind of ended, seemed to have peaked about 10 or 15 years ago, and many of those things are going in the right direction now, but there's been no significant shift in inequality. So help us to understand why that, that, that divergence well, has happened. It's not just in this country either. I don't no. We don't know enough about <laughs> the, the lag periods. Um, there have been a number of papers studying these issues and some say that the changes in physical health uh, take between 3 and 12 years to come through following a change in income inequality and clearly it will differ in different age groups and different causes of death. So it's inevitably an extremely complicated issue. But there are also papers suggesting that not only uh, does social status in early life have a, a lifelong effect uh, on your health and well-being, but also um, that inequality does, um, that children um, born in and brought up in more unequal societies uh, do less well uh, in later life. So there are these very long lag periods. And um, there was a, a time, I remember early on in my research on the effects of inequality, actually using data from uh, the late 1980s or early 90s, when the relationships have, had disappeared. Um, and that was because there was, were such, there'd been such rapid changes in inequality in different countries, and there hadn't been enough time for the effects really to come through. But then they all reappeared as we expected. Um, there are different theories about why, for instance, violence uh, um, has come down in a number of countries uh, despite um, a lack of change in inequality. Um, and one of the papers, for instance, suggests that uh, the explanation is that uh, our social comparisons are now, uh, are now less uh, local. As communities have uh, broken down, people have moved around more, um, we're making social comparisons on a much broader scale, which they suggest are less acute. So the relationships with inequality 
um, still exist. Um, and we can say with some confidence, I think, that the declines in violence would have been greater if there hadn't been uh, the sustained <coughs> or, or rising inequality. In terms, of, um, in terms of what it is you need to convince people of, so in terms of the first book, those of us who knew about you know, Richard's work in particular in the past and the other literature were not surprised, but in a sense you just caught a tide. And there was nothing problematic, it seemed to me, about the kind of idea. You know, it, it had an intuitive appeal. But there's something about this book, which is that you're, you're requiring people to, re, to make a connection between their own inner feelings and social structure. And I know as a sociologist that nothing gets on people's nerves more than being told that they're, what they feel like their own individual characteristics are not their own, but might be... So to say to somebody, the reason you feel shy at a party is because we live in a, you live in an unequal society, that's tough. It's, got, it's a tough pitch, isn't it? I don't know. I think I profoundly disagree with you, actually. I think one of the things that um, we've been surprised by over, over the past decade... And we have given a lot of talks. Rich and I have given over 900 talks between us, um, mostly not together, but to extremely varied audiences, academic audiences, international bodies, old people's homes, schools, you name it, we've talked to those audiences. And the one thing that I think has struck us again and again and again is that when we're describing these connections what, and what we think the connections are a result of, people start nodding. They start not, you see this audience of people nodding. They're saying, yeah, that's why I'm anxious at a party. And, and so I'm not encountering that kind of resistance that, that you're saying. And in fact, what we're saying in this book is the way you feel about yourself and the way your relationships play out between you and your friends and your families and your colleagues, the whole quality of your personal, intimate, social life, it is affected by structural inequality, and we're finding that people are, are responding to that. So I'm not, I'm not as worried as perhaps no, you I'm, are I'm, I'm, about I'm, I'm, encountering I'm that resistance. I'm pleased for you as a sociologist. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling that your self-worth is under question, that you have to put on a good show, make appearances, as, uh, uh, make them count, you worry more about how you're turned out and uh, the Im image you present to people. Well, as you can see that. Clearly, it doesn't apply to me, but um, uh, I've been wanting to turn your collar down all <laughs> evening. Uh, there we are. <laughs> there we are. See, I don't care what people think of me. Now, um, uh, social media. Um, I think if you were talking to parents of uh, teenagers or grandparents of teenagers, they would say, oh, I'm, the thing I'm worried about is less inequality and more social media. Now, social media is a very competitive, quite aggressive, very fast-moving space. What is the relationship, do you think, between social media and the phenomenon? Now, obviously, you know, you're proper academic, so you won't draw conclusions because the research isn't yet there, but what is intuitively your sense of the connection between social media I inequality? A, a very strong belief that social media uh, expresses the characteristics which we've been talking about in the population. And so the aggressiveness uh, in social media um, is, a, is partly an amplification of what we've been talking about and would be perhaps different in a much more equal society. People are nicer on Twitter in Sweden. Mm. I, I would uh, like to know. Yes. <laughs> I don't need that. I mean, there are people who are starting to do research on, on, on these very issues, but we don't yet, um, including colleagues at my own university, but we don't yet have those findings. I, I suspect Richard's intuition is right and that the kind of society you, you live in will be reflected in, in the ways that people use social media. And social media might amplify all of, all of the kinds of processes of um, feeling judged by others, um, doubting your self-worth that, that we've been talking about. But it is only a tool. And for some people in society, social media has offered them an unprecedented way of connecting with other people um, and finding friendship groups that were unavailable to them before. And so I think it's unfair to characterize it as solely evil when it has the potential for so much good as well. I have a deaf niece whose friendship possibilities have been massively expanded by social media. So I don't think we, we can condemn a tool out of hand. It's simply 
the way it's used is a mirror of the society yeah, we live in. People often talk about the way kids use social media and the, the bullying and sometimes suicides caused by it. But uh, one of the things that's now been shown on several data sets is the hugely increased number, uh, incidence of bullying in more unequal mm -hmm. societies. And it's 10 or 15 times as common in more unequal societies. And of course, if you think what bullying is about, it's very like the structure, I think of dominance hierarchies and ranking systems amongst monkeys. You've got the strongest at the top and the weakest at the bottom. Uh, and any doubt about uh, position uh, leads to some trial of strength. And that seems to uh, come out in children's behavior. And of course, they do the same thing in the social media. Um, can we just clarify, I, 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 this is my last question, we'll open it up, but can we just clarify this point? Because I, I, I sense that you're not just talking, and I know because I read the book, you're not just talking about hierarchy, but you're talking about hierarchy in the context of the myth of meritocracy. That in a sense, the kind of feudal hierarchy, whatever its downsides, didn't possibly induce the same levels of anxiety because people's positions were fixed. And the reason you were where you were was because of God and fate. Whereas now you're encouraged to believe that the reason that you are where you are is because <coughs> of your own failings, your own mm. faults. So isn't it the combination of hierarchy and the notion of meritocracy that... We do, to... right at the beginning of the book, go through uh, the major changes in societies historically from uh, hunter-gatherers and the, the great equality to uh, the beginnings of class systems, uh, sometimes with very little or no social mobility. Uh, the, the class system starting to introduce this idea that people are different worth and when you get social mobility where you are is more reflection of your personal worth um, and then bigger in income differences exacerbate the, those same patterns. Uh, I think that's uh, um, really the answer to Matthew's question. Great, okay let's open it up to points from the floor. We'll start with uh, the lady here in the front row. If you tell us your name, that would be great. Um, my name is Caroline Needham, and um, I'm very interested in how early uh, status uh, worries start. And there's been really good research at the Institute of Education talking about in primary school where you have the red table, the blue table, and the yellow table. There isn't a kid alive at a primary school that doesn't know the significance of being at a particular <laughs> table. And the research shows that not only the children at the table that are perceived to be having more challenges in learning uh, are very worried by this, but people at each table are very worried that they might get moved. And I think that all the... Um, work around meritocracy is based on differently able children but we actually embed in our educational system expectations of how children will achieve far too early and in a very arbitrary manner and the people doing that tend to come from a different social class very often than uh, many of their students and I wondered if you had uh, any comment on that. Absolutely, so the, what research shows is that children become aware of status differences very young, certainly by age five. They know where their families rank locally, um, how their dad's jobs compare to other kids' dad's jobs and mum's jobs these days too, um, how big their house is compared to other people, etc. But actually, inequality is affecting those children way before they get to school um, through, through things like its impact on um, mental health and well-being of parents, the time that they have available for parenting, um, um, the worries they might have about debt, etc. So inequality puts a strain on family life very early, probably even prenatally through epigenetic changes in the womb related to stress. And so we start to see social differences in children's abilities a long time before they go to school. But those differences then widen through the school years. Um, an educational, the educational system we have is unable to unpick those because the expectations of children from different class backgrounds are very different. So 
you're spot on, I think, about how early these, these problems can um, arise and they become sort of more entrenched over time. There's quite a tendency to, to believe that uh, these differences in ability are innate, set in stone, so you identify the, the high achievers and bring them on and you know that others are not going to achieve anything. But now we know much more about the malleability of the human brain in early life and we know what learning different things does to our brains from brain scans. Um, it's quite clear that actually uh, your mental ability in different areas of, of life reflects what you do, the kind of environment you have. That's really very well established now. And also, as, we, uh, as it's got much cheaper uh, to um, decode people's uh, genetic makeup, and you've been able to do larger surveys, the evidence that there is a gene for intelligence has really gone out of the window. There are hundreds of genes that affect different aspects of ability. None of us have them all. Um, we have some that make us good at one thing or another. That's it. Let's take a kind of set of, kind of three questions at a time if we can, because there's so many hands and we haven't got that much time. So let's start here. Hi there. Hi, my name's Sally. I'm Excuse me, I'm from um, an, a network of psychologists and others called Psychologists for Social Change. Mm -hmm. um, we've, uh, we've been campaigning about the impact of structural inequalities on mental health for a, for a while. And I, I guess what we come up against is the very strong story within our society of the brain-based um, uh, aspects of mental health, uh, that medication is still the key um, intervention or now talking therapies. Um, as opposed to the structures of neoliberalism, for example. How do you think we can change that story effectively? Because, again, your, your spirit level book really influenced us um, a lot, and we, we got the strap line, uh, equality is the best therapy, from that. And, but how do we change that story uh, to, away from the brain being the, the key kind of mechanism of, of health? Okay, uh, and then uh, there's uh, someone there. And then the person in the aisle. <coughs> Thanks very much. Sorry, Roger Jones. I'm a retired GP and edit the British Journal of General Practice. I just want to go back to the comments about epigenetics, which uh, Karen mentioned in terms of intrauterine uh, influences. I wonder what your thoughts are, looking both back and forward at disadvantage, about the effects of disadvantage not only being expressed through epigenetic mechanisms but also hardwired, so that the expectation of reversing some of these perhaps has to be tempered by the fact that exposure to adverse early life and later life circumstances can actually be quite, have quite enduring effects, which are not simply societal. And then, yep. Hello, my name is Carol, and I work with uh, young women at the Young Women's Trust. My question follows on from the uh, Women's Psychologist for Social Change. And what strikes me is that the meritocracy myth is being bought particularly by young women who have even more pressure on how they look and um, the other um, components of self-image, and that we've gone quite a long way in destigmatizing mental health. And my question is, do you think we may be gone too far? Because I see particularly young women very ready now to self-diagnose rather than to say we are struggling with the challenges that society is facing, is putting us in. So I think we can link questions one and three, really, which is, yeah. is how do we get people to recognise structure and, yeah. and, and move away from a kind of personalised or medicalised accounts? And the second question, which is rather different, which is, I'll do the second. you know, in yeah. a sense, uh, are these changes irreversible if they are imprinted on the brain? Um, I think the, the movement within psychiatry and psychology to recognise the social determinants of, of mental health and well-being is such an important change. And it is quite, you're right, it's quite recent. Um, and the idea that we think about those structural causes rather than just what happened to you in your early childhood and the experiences you've had or your own particular brain chemistry. Um, it's an important shift, but there is still, of course, a backlog of resistance to change. When paradigms change, some people will be resistant to that change, particularly those who have vested interests, such as um, pharmaceutical companies who sell drugs for all of those conditions. Is my microphone gone now? Oh, really? Sorry, I'll just switch. 
I'll take this one. Okay, is that better? Um, so the first step, I think, in, in pushing back against that resistance is knowledge, is showing these patterns, and that's why, we, that's why we've written this book. So that's, that's a first step. But the ideas need to become widespread. People need time to digest and think about them, form professional associations around those issues, um, develop campaigns and activism around it. Um, but I think that the destigmatization of mental illness is positive in that it allows people to come forward and say when they are suffering, um, it's by no means complete. Um, many people with mental illness do still feel very stigmatized by, by their conditions and what other people think of them. And there's a huge amount of unconscious bias towards those with mental illness versus physical illness. A student of mine has just shown that if you have a mental illness, you are half as likely to have your disability allowances um, renewed than if you have a physical illness. So I'm not sure that we could say that the destigmatization of mental illness has yet gone too far. I, I think it's a tricky one. We don't want people self-diagnosing, but we, we do want people to be willing to seek help. Um, we don't want people self-medicating as they increasingly do through internet access to um, psychotropic pharmaceuticals. We certainly don't want to go around accusing the younger generation of being snowflakes who can't cope and are just saying that they're unwell. I, I think that's, that's a dangerously stigmatizing view of, of young people today. So I, I, I find it difficult to answer your question of have we gone too far what we may have done is started to recognize the epidemic of mental ill health and lack of mental well-being before we've actually already as a society to tackle the causes of it. And so we need to catch up, I think. And so it's movements like yours that will help us to do that. I'm going to just, I know that we've left the second question hanging, and I, I apologize for that. But I just, because we run out of time, I just want to take one last set of questions before we finish, if that's all right. Uh, so we'll take the gentleman here, and then uh, in the right in the corner of the room, there's a lady, I think. Uh, thank you. It sort of makes intuitive sense, um, inequality and, and uh, the problems, but I don't see that from the, um, the graphs that you put up. They seem to me more to be blobs that you put a line through. So the first one, for example, local groups, uh, I see two blobs. There's a... There's a a southern and eastern European blob in the bottom right, and then a whole swathe um, parallel across the top, which are the North European countries. So that, to me, tells me more about cultural differences and nothing to do with inequality. And the same on the other ones, um, you know, you, a blob with a couple of outliers. So I don't see it from the graphs that okay. you put up, many of them. And so one other thing as no, well. No, 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 that's, that's a big question. Let's leave it with that. And then... Uh, in the, right in the corner at the back of the room, there was one as well. Hi, um, I'm Amy Pollard. I'm the director of a new non-profit called the Mental Health Collective, which is all about unlocking the potential of social and collective approaches in mental health. Um, I think the outline, uh, the argument that you're outlining... Perhaps you should merge your two organisations. Yeah, I, absolutely. And I encourage Let's talk. you to talk at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm a social scientist, but very much in the club yeah. with, the, with the psychologists. Um, I'm interested very much in, in your diagnosis of the, of the problem, and, and I think the evidence that you're outlining is very convincing. Um, what would your number one action point be? Like, what do you think the solution is? Okay, so uh, that question, and then you know, is it just your kind of, is it just your kind of Nordics versus oh, your no, no, no. hot-headed Latinos? You know, okay, I mean, that's what's going on. Our poor old blobs. Um, <laughs> you know, all of those blobs, they're real countries with real measures, and we look for high-quality measures of the prevalence of different things we're looking for. If there's a oh, line, Mike, sorry. If I there's a line writing. through it, it means that that is a statistically significant correlation that can't be due to chance alone. But your question is more about, are there other things that could explain those um, particular patterns? And what we have found over uh, you know, the past 10 years of seeing more and more research come online 
is that it's very clear that actually these are causal relationships. But remember we said earlier, these aren't the only, inequality isn't the only thing affecting those outcomes, but the notion that it has a causal impact has been reinforced for us by um, reviewing all of the evidence within a causal framework. And in epidemiology, we have to assess causality based on a body of evidence rather than a single study. So you could point to one of those charts and think, oh, well, I just think it's a cultural difference between the northern countries or, or southern Europe. But then you see the same kind of analysis across the regions of China or Latin American countries or the American states. And you start to realize, well, it probably isn't culture that's explaining all of that common variance. We look for um, studies that show when inequality changes, outcomes change. So Sweden has become rapidly more unequal and its child well-being has declined as we would expect. So I don't want to spend too, too much time on that, but we are convinced that we're looking at a causal relationship that has a coherent story and explanation, um, and that the data supporting it are vast, multidisciplinary, and sort of multimodal, everything from the neurophysiological imaging to our blobs and lines. Richard, the final word from you, Br a brief word if on you action. If you may. On action. On action. Uh, Apart well, from buying your book, of course. Uh, the biggest reason why inequality has, uh, in income differences has risen so much uh, is not the decline in redistribution, although that's very important. It's the increase in income differences before tax. Uh, the, the people at the top awarding themselves these huge runaway pay awards. And so we believe that you have to both redistribute deal with tax havens and tax avoidance, make uh, income tax progressive again, but also, um, more fundamentally, um, introduce forms of economic democracy. Uh, about half the members of the European Union have some uh, legislation for um, employee participation um, and representation on management boards. We need that. We think there should be uh, laws to oblige companies large companies to pass shares to an employee control trust so over the years gradually control would shift to employees uh, that seems to be good for productivity it's good for the experience of work amongst employees um, and uh, it's uh, i can't remember what the third thing was <laughs> but i should just say something about no, the epigenetics oh go on one sentence the on epigenetics Epigenetics aren't fixed even for the whole of your life. Uh, a lot of the evidence shows that uh, it can change uh, as your experience change. Uh, work on monkeys, putting them in different groups, shows that in, if their social status is different in uh, different groups, then the epigenetics uh, will change fairly soon. Uh, that's not tr true of all epigenetic change, but it's certainly true of some. Great. Thank you for that, Richard. Um, so... Um, uh, Richard and Kate's brilliant book is available outside. If you, oh, you don't, I don't need that, do I? Sorry, I'm so confused now. Um, anyway, uh, the, uh, the book is available outside, and I'm sure you get two signatures for the price of one uh, this evening. And then, of course, if you've got it signed, that's a status symbol, so you'll feel less, you'll feel less shy. You can go to parties with it and feel less shy because you've got a signed. Can we change the signs first? Uh, that, excellent, excellent. So we can we can do all that. Um, uh, I personally think one of the biggest problems to, in all this is that, of course, the Scandinavian countries have higher well-being, but the problem is that because of the growth of Scandinavian crime thrillers on TV, everyone now feels that Sweden and Denmark are just full of kind of mass murderers. So I think that's, that's, that's a big problem. Like Oxford, yeah, like, oh, like Oxford, yeah, that's right, and Midsummer as well. Um, okay, enough of this. Uh, it's been a, 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 a fantastic conversation. I'm sure this book is going to be as influential and important uh, as your last book, and we're honoured to have had you here tonight so just please join me in thanking Kate and Richard. Thank